Good morning, Ottawa. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with my dear friend and our long term uh, friendship over 25 years with uh, similar fascinations but coming at things from different angles. And so we hope that today you will find our presentations very complimentary and that um, some of the things that you've been asking about actually might get answered in what I'm about to share. I seem to be getting quite a glare off my glasses and the reflection on this, so you're going to be patient with me while I, I kind of go on and on. Anybody ever felt like this? <laughs> on a regular basis? Uh, yeah. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. So, nice little quote. Eckhart Tolle, being spiritual has nothing to do with what you believe. Why? Because we choose what we believe. We actually reach a point in our life of maturity where we understand that what we believe about ourselves and the nature of reality in life and the divine, let's call it that, just to use a, a neutral vocabulary, is actually a choice. People chose to believe that the earth was flat. We choose to believe. So we're going to hold that piece because it has everything to do with your state of consciousness. And consciousness, let's put the word awareness in there. So consciousness and awareness are going to work together. So some existential questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is the self and what is consciousness? And if we had all day, I would walk you through some of this, but each of those questions is basically a seminar into itself. So I'm hoping to do a little kind of table of contents, a little overview of uh, some much larger concepts uh, and during the question time hopefully be able to give you enough information to go forward with. So, consciousness, what is it? Is it a fundamental aspect of the universe? And can we understand that the brain mediates consciousness but it is not the source of consciousness? Can we take that as a given? Okay. Modern science is now aligning with great spiritual traditions about the nature of human consciousness. For a long time, uh, more um, recent thinking has kept things very separate. Fortunately, as we're going to keep looking, we're going to see that modern science is catching up with ancient traditions. Now, all the ancient traditions we're seeing things, the indigenous people, the old cultures, uh, the old uh, traditions. We're, we're giving uh, what's called the perennial philosophy, a core group of principles which can be found throughout the world, never mind the geography, the culture, the religion. There's these core teachings that have been dubbed the perennial philosophy that can be found everywhere. And that these teachings speak to the heart of the nature and the core of ourselves. And what's wonderful for those of you, and I'm going to take a guess that most people in this, in this audience here today are interested in the emerging fields uh, in science. So quantum physics, biology, isn't the new biology marvelous? It's just everything is right on the frontier feeling around the edges, and because of technology, the ability to communicate new findings and collaborate and work together is changing how quickly that frontier is being uh, discussed and um, uh, reviewed and shared around the world. Medicine, quantum mechanics, technology, now what they're doing is they're finding things that continue to affirm. So you'll have physicists saying, wow, all we are is vibrating light. This seems to be a pulse. No, it's a wave. No, it's a pulse. No, it's a wave. Okay? And the gurus are saying, uh, we're vibrating light. We've been saying that for thousands of years and you didn't believe us. But now you can actually see it, kind of see it. Now you're starting to accept it. 
Indigenous peoples have been saying we're all one, we're all connected. You, me, and the trees and the rocks and the stars, we're all connected. And now scientists are saying, hey, you know what? We're all connected. <laughs> so we're at a very special moment in human consciousness. And it's a moment to pay attention. And those of you who in this room today work in the field where you can start making a difference by helping people to wake up. Now, the nature of time and matter, the existence of the soul, whatever we're going to call that, however we're going to, you know, try and relate to these numinous uh, experiences of, of spirituality that are so difficult to to measure, to define, to describe. It's sort of like trying to describe swimming in the ocean. Okay, I'm a scuba diver, I know there's a couple of other people in the room are. And how do you describe being in the ocean and scuba diving to someone who's never seen the ocean? Someone who grew up in the middle of the desert somewhere in, in Africa, a young person. The most water they've ever seen collected together is in a clay jug. And now you're going to try and describe the ocean and all the life in it and what it's like to swim in the ocean. It's very hard to relate. But if you speak to somebody who's also a scuba diver and they say, hey, have you, uh, did you dive on that reef? And you go, yeah, I, I dived on that reef. <laughs> There's no more words necessary, right? Okay, researchers in the field, any anthropologists in the room? No? no? One? Okay, thank you. I always want to acknowledge the ethnobotanists and the anthropologists. They are often an unacknowledged field, and they are the people we need right now to hold indigenous wisdom of the indigenous people. There's been so much that's been obliterated, and we need to honor and respect that. Now, these ancient sacred technologies permit access to realms while falling outside the contemporary Western worldview. We can agree on that, right? They are in alignment with new scientific discoveries. So here we have all the ancient wisdoms, and we have these sacred technologies. Now, most of these sacred technologies we're going to see in a minute um, include the use of, of plant, plant medicine, sacred plants, power plants, um, known by different words. Okay. For, just for me, I have to separate entheogens and psychedelics. I'm going to do that. I know that the term psychedelics is what is covered, and it's usually the one that is used to describe all of these in a package deal. But simply because of, of the work that I do, the experiences that I've had, the sacrament that I work with for the last 23 years, I just want to make the distinction because how these substances are used is actually very different. So in the entheogen, you see a pot of uh, what could be the Sankadami or Huasca, you have the leaves and the, and the Ayahuasca vine, the Manasteriopsis kaki, you have the leaves and the Psychotrium viridis tree, and these two combined with only water and the fire is what makes the sacrament of the Sankadami or Huasca of the union of the vegetal. On the other side, you have psychedelics, it could be laboratory made. Now, there, of course, there are other plants, I'm just choosing these two to look at. So are we okay if we do that distinction for right now? Let's talk about non-ordinary states of consciousness and the search for well-being and wholeness. If we take as a principle that within each of us there is a thirst for wholeness, there is a, a quest for well-being, that some part of us wants to move towards wholeness, wants to move towards well-being. And that part of us can be, be given a, um, a, a major position within us whereby we listen to it as inner wisdom and we work with it hand in hand to be guided by it. Or other things can get in the way. All kinds of internal dynamics can start to interfere and interrupt, interrupt with that. Okay? Now, the search for well-being, for spirituality, or who am I? Why am I here? You know, what always fascinates me is that people always want to know, where do I go when I die? Better question, where was I before I was here? My four-year-old granddaughter asked me that about two months ago. So did mine. 
at the same time. Yeah. Well, something's happening. <laughs> you don't know what it is, but something's happening. Okay. And she asked me very seriously, where was I before I was here, Grandma? I said, good question, sweetheart. Let's start with the ABCs of it. <laughs> I'm warming up. Thank you. Okay, so there's no general definition of non-ordinary states of consciousness. It's because to describe that would rely on a normal state of consciousness. Who's in a normal state of consciousness? Okay, so there's a continuum. Okay, who's normal? <laughs> there's a continuum of average, okay, average behavior, average consensual agreement on average behavior, average function, average. That's a continuum. Some days we function better, sometimes our mood is better, and so there's this ebb and flow of everything, right? So to try and define that means we have to keep a very open-minded, open-hearted map on this. Throughout human history, cross-culturally non-ordinary states of consciousness, so N-O-S-C, everybody got that, and played a very important role. Humans seek transcendent experiences. We seek them. We may not know that we're seeking them. We may, and we'll see in a few minutes, how our culture and society has influenced us. Mother culture is always talking. Most of us don't even notice. Mother culture is always talking. Pay attention. We seek deep inner exploration and transformation using non-ordinary states. This is the history of human. So the experience is beyond mental and theoretical nature. It's very difficult, as we've already said, to try and describe and define. However, there are ways of working with this which can be helpful. They are outside our everyday awareness and they go beyond our everyday perceptions. So um, we have our everyday reality, get up, do our thing, get to work, or our classes, or get our kids to school, or whatever it is our daily routine is, and we, we fall into that routine and pattern, and it can either be a healthy lifestyle, or maybe not such a healthy lifestyle, again, there's that continuum, and how do we ratchet up to the healthier and away from the unhealthy. But the bottom line is the non-ordinary states are larger than that. Now, they lead to self-awareness, personal transformation, spiritual opening, and the development of new perceptions for everyday life. Perceptions of who am I and what, what is my life about. Now, non-ordinary states can provide information about the human psyche, consciousness, and the nature of reality. It becomes possible to expand our view of the cosmos, of ourselves. Who am I? Oh, I thought I was this. I'm not this. Oh, I see that who I think I am is who I think people want me to be. Or who I am is what I thought I had to be to achieve or get dot dot fill in the blank. So all of these perceptions of who we think we are and what reality is about. It's a fascinating and very deep study. It provides an opportunity to transform the past, such as old traumas, biography, birth, to resolve karma and to change the narrative of one's life. So, consciousness. In many cultures, Eastern or Indigenous, these have been an integral part of everyday life in rituals, rites of passages, and daily practice. Unfortunately, Western civilization, that's what I'm going to call it, Western that includes Europe, the influences of Europe over the last few hundred years, and and the cultural genocide and genocide of the people, the indigenous people in the Americas, and the bringing over the European way of thinking is Western civilization. We lack, we do not have an ordinary state of consciousness as a cultural norm. It doesn't exist. We have sex, drugs, and rock and roll since the late 50s. Okay? We don't have an non-ordinary state. We are not a culture that meditates, that prays really outside of Sunday morning or Saturday morning, temple, church, synagogue, put your best hat on, and off you go. 
We don't have that deep in our tradition. We don't trans sing, trans stand, get together in the tribe and fast together or pray together or do summer rites and winter rites and change of season rituals. And, and we don't do any of that. It all got left behind. And that's another lecture as to how that happened. Okay. Now, in ordinary states, and here's the hard part, as a cultural norm, they were dismissed in scientific inquiry during the early 20th century, pathologized. Okay, if you had a vision, if you had a vision, you were probably psychotic, schizophrenic, certainly troubled. Since the time I was a very young child, I had profound dreams and spiritual visions. And I didn't share them with anybody because the culture around me had nothing, no clue. We were, I was raised in the Anglican church, and went to church every Sunday morning with your gloves and your best hat on, and you better sit quietly and don't move, right? It's church. It was a lovely ritual. I loved the hymns, the prayers, everything was lovely and nice, and shake hands with the minister on your way out. My spirit was never nurtured. And nothing that I was hearing or learning there ever helped me understand the experiences I had. By the time I was a teenager, I was beginning to think, am I crazy or what? And then I started to find certain books. And I'm a young teenager, and I'm starting to read all this Huxley. And I'm starting to read um, all kinds of books, even the Old Testament. Oh, look, all of these prophets, they had visions, they weren't crazy. People actually thought those visions were good. So I began to find my way in a culture that left no breadcrumbs for me to follow. And just find my way and trust spirit to guide me in, in the ways that I could be guided. Unfortunately, there is still, and again, this is just a throwaway. Uh, you're familiar with Dr. John Nelson's book, Healing the Split, a, a, a brilliant uh, piece of work on the, making the distinction of the continuum between mental illness. Yes, there is true mental illness, and it does exist. We need to recognize that and, and have the best techniques, understanding maps, and treatment for it to spiritual emergency, which we'll get to in a minute. And the distinction between, or the overlap, and it's quite profound, again, this is, that's a whole other lecture, we'll get a little bit of it, uh, just a bit today. Okay, let's jump into transpersonal psychology. Um, the developing field emphasizes some very important things. The individual human experience, mystical and spiritual experiences, interconnectedness of self with others, the world, and of course, uh, nature and community, and let's call it the divine for today. And the potential for self-transformation, personal growth, development. In the past, there was a separation of body, mind, and spirit by medicine, psychiatry, and clergy. Uh, doctors in medicine, they own the body. Psychiatry started to own the mind, right? And, and the clergy, they own the soul. Don't go messing with the soul. That belongs to the clergy, right? Now, what's happening is that separation had to change because we are not separate. The mind-body uh, work that was starting to develop in the 70s and the early 80s, and I had the privilege of being involved in some of that very early work, running around the states and mainly the states, uh, meeting with people on the frontier of the mind-body, psychoneurology, all the things that were fascinating me. How these inter interchange and affect how the body affects the mind, how the mind affects the body. In the meantime, we have William James, the American psychologist. He opened a door to a reconsideration of mystical experiences. And then we have Sigmund Freud, who we have to tip our hat to him because of Okay, some of his work I certainly don't agree with, but at the time he was opening doors for us to understand some things uh, about human nature and the reality of being human. Carl Jung took his work, Freud's work, much further, and he put onto the map of the self the collective unconscious and the archetypes, uh, synchronicity, and all of these profound things. Now, these, this is not an intellectual construct, whoever asked about the archetypes. Archetypes are not intellectual constructs. 
You speak to a real shaman or a real elder who's a long time uh, working in these realms, the non-ordinary realms and the non-visual realms, and, and these are real. They're as real as this is. And this was my experience from a young child. Those realms are as real for me as this realm is. And the shaman's walk is one foot in this world and one foot in that. And that's not an easy walk. And understanding for those of you who might be called uh, to these kinds of paths or these kinds of callings, learning to walk like that is not easy. And again, our culture doesn't have models for that has no models to help people understand how to develop themselves spiritually in the way that we're speaking of today. So Carl Jung did us a big favor introducing how we're connected to the collective unconscious. In this moment, all of us in this room, we have our personal unconscious, what's in our own personal unconscious, which is connected to our family unconscious, which is connected to our clan or tribe, or then nation unconscious, the unconscious of the Canadian people is connected to them quite different, say, to the uh, unconscious of the Japanese nation. It just is. But then you go to the collective unconscious, so you see, step by step, everything is connected. Roberto Saggioli, the Italian psychiatrist who developed psychosynthesis, a big shout out for him, I trained in his work. And this is an outstanding um, uh, work to give you a much better understanding of the self. His model of the self is really profound of the unconscious <coughs> and the connections that we have in our lower unconscious and our higher unconscious and how to broaden that sense of self. Okay, East meets West. The conversions of the 60s introduced the Eastern traditions to Western culture and Western science to the East. Buddhism, Hinduism offering meditation, introspective practices, a broader view of the divine and the deities, and all of these things were essential. We would not be here today having these discussions if this had not happened. And in part, this happened because of, they say, an ancient prophecy when the iron bird flies, then uh, Buddhism will go west, fly west, and the iron bird being the plane. And but it also happened because LSD was got a little bit out on the streets. There was cultural revolution, and uh, a profound amount of changes happened. Now, it was in uh, 1971 that I myself took LSD twice, a long time ago, and it merged very quickly into one experience. And that experience, I had a profound. It was done in a safe, a very safe, uh, moderated experience, um, but at the same time, um, it, it was not a scientific setting or a medical setting, it was very much a friendship setting. At the time, um, my profound experience culminated at the end of the experience with me meeting what I can only describe as a being or a presence, who very lovingly but firmly said to me, you will not be doing this again. <laughs> and here's not there. <laughs> and if you've met that being, you know that being means business, right? And then we got presented with what I call my personal Ten Commandments. And being said to me, you'll be doing this. And so like Moses coming down off the mountain, but my personal commandments were very personally for me. It wasn't anything to give anybody else. It was for me personally. And so I trusted and followed that. And in a few minutes, we'll come to North meets South. Okay, more about um, our dear friend uh, Stanislav Grof. He, the four categories you've already heard about, sensory experiences, motor manifestations, biography, the story of this lifetime. Okay, perinatal birth, which is, uh, I really encourage people to read his work. Um, and the, the great gift is putting the birth experience into the map of uh, the Sagioli's and Jung's map, adding that to the map. So now we have a much better defined map of what is going on inside the person and what is influencing us and affecting us. So uh, the transpersonal realms include past life, 
archetypal experiences, connections with many different realms, let's call them shamanic realms, divinity realms. He developed the process called holotropic breathwork, again, a, a wonderful process that helps people enter into an ordinary state of consciousness and access the possibility of transformation and healing. He contributed to the defining of spiritual emergence and spiritual emergency, which is what we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, north meets south, and the conversions of the early 90s brought some of the traditions of the Amazon to the north. And again, there's always a gift. What the West gave the East, we, gave, we had technology, modern technology, modern science, meaning ancient traditions, the north and the south are meeting. Again, there's a gift that's being shared. It also is allegedly the uh, culmination or the manifestation of another ancient prophecy, which is when the eagle of the north dances with the condor of the south, which is about a 500-year-old prophecy, then peace and healing can begin. So let peace and healing begin. Okay. So notably, ayahuasca, as particularly in the form of the sons of Daini, and uh, waspa, which is the name of Vishtal, which has been internationalized since the early 90s. So um, the spirituality and worldviews of the South are considerably different to Northern philosophies. Uh, those of you who have encountered uh, the South American philosophies, they have a completely different worldview. They, again, are very spiritually um, uh, kind of culture. Their culture is very spiritualized. They much more people have spiritual practices and religious practices that we, than we do in North America. And so what's interesting now is modern science is exploring the possibilities of these ancient practices and the potential benefits. Uh, 23 years ago, uh, I went to Brazil. It was the 1996 International Transpersonal Association Conference. Since my 1971 experience, I had not participated in any kind of um, plants or, or other substances in any way. I took as gospel what I had been told, and it was working just fine for me. But then about a year and a half before the conference, uh, was to come, I started to dream that I'm in the forest, I'm wearing white, and I'm drinking ayahuasca. So I do business with the being, hello, hello, I'm there, uh, am I supposed to be doing this? Yes, you're doing this, follow. Now many other things have happened in between, um, which is far too long a story for today, it's a story for another day, uh, that was indicating that this was the direction that I must go in. So off off I went uh, with a group of some people, some friends, uh, about 40 group of about 45 of us, uh, of which uh, Dr. Groff was one. We were in the boat uh, bailing our way up the Amazon in a little wooden dugout canoe. And um, sorry, did I just edit you? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, no details. So, um, drinking Sanzalini and uh, finding a life mission. I had been shown something about 11 years beforehand that something would be arriving and something would be opening. And I was to take these certain preparations towards it, and I did. And then I was shown, okay, you did what you needed to do, and now you're here, and, and this is what you will be doing. So I brought the Santo Daini in 1996, back to Canada, opened a church, founded a church, I continued my um, apprenticeship in the Santo Daini for 14 years, and became an independent center in 2010. Those of you who were at our recent conference, um, you can see what has happened. 17 years, I worked with Health Canada, to have the religion recognized and to be able to import the sacrament legally. And so that's where that arrived. Now, how do we achieve non-ordinary states of consciousness? And um, I'm giving you all of this as framework. You know, Dr. Brock spoke so beautifully presenting about substances and psychedelic substances and possibilities for therapeutic treatment and possibilities for research and the research that's happening right now. And, and I and our little church completely support research and cooperated with it and supported from the get-go. 
Um, we have a medical and scientific advisory committee uh, that I founded immediately when I was founding the church because I believe that this is the through that square door is how we must go. We must. However, there's many ways of achieving, achieving non-ordinary states. And I think that it's time that our culture looks at how we collectively together, those of us who hold the interest or feel the mission, can start to bring those um, those very profound human experiences back into their proper place in our culture. So rituals and rites of passages included but not limited to, so trance singing, trans, now the indigenous people as you know, the Inuit, they have their trance singing, it's profound and beautiful, I don't know if you've ever seen the throat singing. So chanting, singing, music, rhythmic dancing, fasting, all of these things have been part of the human experience as we can go back till we were in caves. And this is the human race is a tribal race, and we're not living as a tribe anymore. And I think these, some of these factors we're going to see is why we are suffering as much as we are suffering, why our young people are so unhappy. We've lost our roots, we have no maps, we have no elders or wisdom keepers. So then you have your spontaneous non ordinary states of consciousness which are precipitated by extraordinary or even everyday experiences. So a woman, for example, could be giving birth. You could be having sex with your loved one. You could be walking along the street. I've been walking along the street with a bag of groceries head and part and I've shown something. So it, how do you integrate these things if your culture has no maps for them? And you have no one to talk to and then if you see a professional, because how many trained professionals in psychology or even psychiatry list on one or two hands in Canada actually understand transpersonal experiences. So how can we bring this all forward? So the optimum conditions for non-ordinary states is first of all is a ritual setting. The authentic presence of qualified individuals. Now that's a big question that I think that when we're doing the round table, that we're going to be talking quite a bit about that. As far as I'm concerned, it's something I want to engage with you, the audience, in conversation. Okay? What's a qualified individual? What does that look like? <coughs> what kind of training, what kind of skills, what kind of experience is needed to ensure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past? Right? We can all agree on that. Okay, so accepting the state will have positive effects even if it's a really difficult experience. Trusting that something we're going to call the inner healer or wisdom will guide. Surrendering to the experience. Um, most of us have a normal um, kind of autopilot of resistance, control. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> control, resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're hardwired with that. So uh, be patient, be aware, Those, that's where meditation techniques and um, practices really help us learn to trust and to let go. And so allowing the possibility for anything to arise, which is difficult for most of us. And I think I've come to the end of my time, have I? Yes, okay, good time. So here's a little quote from Albert Einstein, one of my favorites. It's boiling up there, it's freezing down here. <laughs> Everybody read it? Free ourselves from this prison, widening our circle of compassion. versus the Western indoctrinated 
medical sort of school. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more then. But if you're asking about my personal background, yes, you should find that on our on our church website. Actually, my bio will be there. There's a brief bio. Um, I trained uh, in psychosynthesis and the work of Dr. Frisco. My own spiritual experience has led me into, uh, from the 70s, from my LSD experience 71, I was immediately in the ashrams and training with the Buddhists. So I did years of work in Eastern traditions. And um, this gave me the groundwork for being able to hold my experiences and frame them differently and work with different maps. Uh, and then I got called into, uh, I was started having, uh, in the middle late 80s, I started having spontaneous shamanic initiations. And so I went looking for shamanic trainings and shamans and everything I could put my hands on and started meeting with and speaking with people. Uh, academically, my other work had been in nutrition. My first doctorate was in that. I had been working with, all my research was, the practice was with working with people who had emotional and behavior disorders. I was fascinated with the mind-body work that I had been uh, working with through the entire 80s, from the late 70s, and um, uh, was, was changing the negative behavior of the, of the populations that I was working with, getting a 54% reduction in negative behavior, just changing diet, and putting a once-a-week therapist session in. And 54% is huge. I was replicating work that had been done uh, in large, uh, with large numbers, thousands of people. Um, people like uh, Stephen Schoenthal, Dr. Schoenthaler, and Alexander Schaus down in the United States. They're working in prisons and, and homes. And it's remarkable what we were seeing. Um, this continued to evolve just based on my own spiritual experiences I was being called into. But at that point, I didn't know I had a life mission with the Sons of Nine. But everything was guiding me, okay, you're done here, time to go here now. So I trained in psychosynthesis, then I met uh, Dr. Stanislav Groff and Dr. Paul Groff at the same time, uh, 25 years ago, is it? No, longer, 26, 27 years ago. And I trained with, I went through the Groff transpersonal training. And at that point I was in Brazil <coughs> and came back and uh, started the church. And I did my kind of 14 years under apprenticing under the elders of the line that we were with then. So I'm not sure if that's helpful. Uh, I'm also a ordained interfaith minister uh, with a doctorate in divinity. And all of these things, Spirit says, you go to mm -hmm. And I would go, really? <laughs> Back to school at age 16. Are you kidding me? Thank you. Uh, I'm back to school at the age of 58, by the way. So. Um, you, at the beginning of your, your presentation, you said that the brain is not the source of consciousness. Would you share with us your view as to what the source of consciousness is? Uh, okay. Mm. I. I personally think that the divine, creative, intelligence, consciousness permeates everything, everywhere. I have a very indigenous view on this, that the rocks, the trees, the more we discover, the more science discovers, um, we find that, you know, that there's, there's um, mold and spores that are fungi that are talking to the roots of the trees about what's going on with the other trees. Is that not consciousness? That's consciousness. So the, you know, the spider that makes its web, the everything, everywhere you look, the birds that migrate together, everywhere you look, you can see that human activity is usually interfering with the ongoing manifestation of consciousness. Now, yes, life on Earth is still primitive, it's still violent, we can agree that the human species is a greedy, selfish, violent race. Do you know what I mean? uh, sorry, I'm not offending anybody. <laughs> I'm hearing little gasps around the room. Yeah, that's my take on it. And, and that in a second, we can be that and that we have to work hard to use the strengths and gifts that we've been given or that we have to awaken our consciousness, to choose peace, to choose 
uh, dignity, to choose respect, that these are things that we develop and we choose them. And we, if we have children, grandchildren, if we're a teacher in classrooms, a childcare worker, that we are teaching children to do this. Watch two year old, two year olds. They hit each other. They take their toys. Mine, I saw it first. This is the human species. Yeah. And we are trying to train them in a way that's more respectful and more kind and more open. So the, the brain, uh, you know, there's not a good analogy. There's only half good analogies. If we look at a television, we can say the television is the mediator for the programs. You know, Johnny Carson is not in the TV. Okay. The TV is the mediator for all those programs. The source of the programs is way outside of the physical television. So the physical brain is, again, it's not a mechanical Newtonian object like a computer or television, so it's a, not a great comparison. You know, but it is mediating. And it is our soul, our consciousness, that can actually change neural pathways. Those of you who are following the modern neuroscience, how fascinating is this, right? Get on board, folks. Start reading this stuff. You know, by, by what you think, if you have a negative old story that you keep going to, your, your brain will connect, connect, make a six-lane highway to it. Zoop, you're there. You change that, you stop going to that story, you forgive, you expand, you meditate on it, you choose to think something different, you change your belief around that, and that, that six lane shrinks down to a little country lane, and eventually the brain files its, you know, that story gets filed way, way back somewhere where there's almost no energy around. Did I answer your question a little bit? Okay. Yes. Uh, answers, right? yeah. There's actually two questions. Anyone go deep? So it was kind of relevant to what you were just saying. Uh, the, when you open you your presentation, it's like we get to choose our beliefs, and that's something I've always found really contentious, right? It's like, oh, there are many things I'd like to believe that I just kind of, I guess my more logical, analytical side doesn't find very convincing. A lot of stuff, like I remember when I first heard about reincarnation, like I would like that to be a lot, to, to, to be true, but I'm having trouble finding that there's a conviction behind it, behind that <laughs> belief. Uh, is your answer just trying to oh. cause highways? Just visiting again and again until... Yes, well, yes, I'm not saying... Well, your analogy with highways, yeah. like carving out neural... Yeah, neural, pathways, yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that how you'd say you choose your beliefs? No, I think that what I mean when I'm saying that we choose our beliefs, um, there's a, it's a, a bit more complex than than being very simple, okay, is let's say that we believe that we're not a good person because of something that happened in our childhood. I'm, you know, a shame-based experience of self has led to I'm not a good person. You want to go forward with that belief or you want to change that belief? You want to change that belief. To do so, you have to release the grief around the loss of feeling wholeness as a child. You have to grieve the discomfort of feeling shamed and the situation that led to it. So it's a grieving process. But it's also activating third chakra where I believe our will lives and activating our will that I want to believe in my strengths. I want to believe that I can be different from this view I've held of myself since I was still in the blank, two years old, six years old. I don't want to believe that that's who I am anymore. You say you like the idea of reincarnation. Okay. Well, what's wrong with, you know, when, when it first dropped into my head about reincarnation, well, maybe 50 years ago or more, it was like, yeah, that feels right. I can't say I believe in it, I don't believe in it, but it feels right. But it took until I started to have past lives come up for me in dreams. You wouldn't believe how many people, when they dream, and I go, oh, I had this strange dream. Really? What was your dream of all that? I felt like I was living an entire lifetime. Yeah, I thought you were probably, you may have just been dreaming it, but it's just as likely that you were tapping into something either in the collective unconscious, or that that was actually something that you experienced. And then it gets a little bit blurry. Was that actually me? 
Or was that something that I was tapping into, like going on Netflix, you know what I'm saying? It's up there, it's up there in the collective unconscious, and I just slipped into the story for a few minutes. Now, it, to go deeper than that, there are experiences that you can have either in breath work or certainly in the dining or spontaneously where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was the life that you lived. And the reason is, is because you see the echo of it in your life today. The echo is there. You can go, oh, I can see that that started there. And then it echoed into this life, that belief, that experience, the way I hold my body. It's all here today. And then as I grieve that, or resolve that, or understand that, or forgive that, or celebrate it, or whatever needs to happen, it releases me today. That's the power. Um, any past life material that I have experienced in non ordinary states of dream, I have never been anybody important or famous. <laughs> never. It's always a very ordinary life. A very ordinary life. Um, so I really I appreciate this um, distinction between, a, or lack of distinction between an ordinary state of consciousness and non-ordinary state of consciousness, and understanding and appreciating the idea of the brain as this receiver um, that, that certainly in respect to mood disorders just gets too rigid, and that we know what's happening neurologically with these experiences, and tapping into or tuning into this unity conscious or non-dual experience loosens that rigidity and creates an opportunity to sort of be more adaptive to your environment. But I'm also, I wonder if you could speak to, or something that I wonder about on the flip side is that the kind of paradox going to the other side of it is this delusion, you know, it's also um, what allows like dual existence to actually function. And you go all the way to the other side of can, tapping. Can, can, you, can you clarify your question? Yes. Okay, sorry. My, my question is, um, what happens on the other side? Like, what's the um, the psychosis on the other side of sort of staying in a unity consciousness space where everything is connected? Like, um, what is the? Um, I wonder if you could just speak to the the dangers, I guess, of modulating that receiver too far to the point where you're not we're not actually able to engage with and. Uh, communicate other with other sort of beings in dual reality. Uh, I think we see that with people who, uh, especially maybe in children who have severe autism, that they're actually connected on a wavelength that we're not connected in in our regular state, or ordinary state of consciousness. I mean, I'm just saying that as a thought or an observation um, that some of the things that we think. Uh, that go under mental illness, our mental illness as we are currently using that. Um, other things are spiritual emergency. I referred to John Nelson's work. Now, usually what happens um, when you start actively feeling called to work with non ordinary states, there has to be the right, um, this is challenges with integration. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and, and together we will. There absolutely needs to be, uh, the maps need to be there. You know, would you get into uh, a boat with somebody to cross the ocean and they say, you know, I've puttered around the harbor a few times uh, in a little boat. We should be good in this sailboat going across the ocean. Would you? Did you get on an airplane with somebody who said, you know, I've been a passenger enough times, I should not have flied this thing. <laughs> okay, well, I'm laughing, but you know how many people are actually using ayahuasca or sacred plants who have absolutely no apprenticeship or training or qualifications or skills or maps, let's just call them maps, to actually guide the people that they're serving? This is quite scary. So, you know, in the, in the old way of working with these plants, there would be the elders, the wise men and wise women, and they were the guardian of the plants. I am the guardian, the designated member is what Health Canada calls us, <clears throat> but I am the guardian of the sacrament. That's how it is. It's not just given to people. There's the guardian. 
is the person who knows, when I serve you this, I am now responsible for where you go and what happens to you. And I, I need to know where you potentially could go, which territories you may be going to, because I have now visited them enough times that I've met the dragons in that territory, and I've met the divine beings in that territory, so I know how to deal with the dragon, and I know how to, how to approach the divine being. So if I see you going there, I know how to help you do that. But if that is lacking, what happens? We're going to hopefully talk about this some more.
this kind of mechanistic or Newtonian way of looking at the world, okay, in the way you adjust the octane in your gasoline for your car. You know, if you adjust something in your brain that is going to make, yeah, but they're leaving out that everything is constantly changing. Our body is constantly making new body. Everything that we breathe, we eat, we drink is creating our body. We have epidemics of depression, anxiety, and addictions in our culture and society. Apart from genuine mental illness, are we pathologizing the variances of human experience? Is that possible too? Are we pathologizing grief? Are we turning grief, human grief, the depth of the, the experience of human grief, of the regular normal anxiety of, of closing one chapter and going into another? Wow, it's fantastic. I finished my master's. Yay, isn't that fabulous? Oh my god, I'm terrified. Now I've got to take the next step. Shouldn't that have a whole different worldview of working with it rather than just a pill? Okay, let's get going. Um, so, uh, medical illness and genetic factors obviously play a role. Environmental factors in our work in our home and computer community. What have we done to our air, water, and food? First of all, we've changed our diet in the last, let's say, 70 years. Now, I, I was giving lectures like this in the, in the 70s and the early 80s, and trying to get people on board with some of the things we're going to briefly go over in a few minutes. What you eat, drink, and breathe is what your body makes its material out of. If you're not eating properly, if you're not, if what you're drinking is not copacetic for healthy well-being, then isn't all of that going to contribute? Never mind what, what business and agri agricultural business and corporations have done to our environment based on human activity and wanting more of certain things, so they make monocultures and they're changing what's going into our entire system, how can we pretend that doesn't affect us? And if so, what is the effect? What is the effect? Somehow is what we're seeing the result of many things coming together. Is, is it a signal from our body soul that something requires our attention? So now we're getting more into the area in which um, we're going to talk a bit more about. So we're going to leave aside genetic factors, medical illness, and environmental factors. We're going to tick our, the box. We're going to say, yes, that's a completely different conversation, perhaps for another day. But a signal from the body soul that something requires our attention. It's, uh, for nearly 40 years, I had a private practice. I did group uh, work. I was a teacher. I did the holotropic breath work of Dr. Stan Brock for, I don't even remember, 12, 14 years, every month, workshops. For 23 years, I've been drinking and then serving dining every month, twice a month. I've worked with a lot of people in non-ordinary states and in therapeutic situations, and group and individuals. And I can tell you that all of this is there and it's real. A signal for the body that something needs our attention. Blocked grief. That's probably one of the biggest things that is not dealt with properly in our society. Yes, we can look back and we can see the, so a few people in the field, you know, we can look at, I don't know, blank on his name, somebody help me, the wonderful man up at, was he, yeah? That's as well. Victoria who developed a palliative care. Okay, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, her work on grief. Okay, so we see that there was people who said, hey, we need to deal with this differently. We need to find a whole other approach. <coughs> and Celia, was that who you going to say his work in, in Montreal on stress? It's like, wait a minute, what's happening here? There's three stages of stress. Can anybody name them? First one, red alert. Red alert, red alert, red alert. Okay. Second one. I can cope. I'm, I'm okay. I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. That's stage two. Yes. What's the third one? Depression. Shouldn't we be addressing the stress and how we're managing it? I'm not anti-pill, by the way. I'm not anti-pharmacology at all. It has its place, it, it, and it needs its place. And thank you to modern science, but complementary, not one without the other. Self-hatred. At the root of every depressed person that I have ever worked with, there's been a piece of self-hatred, mm -hmm. of blame, of guilt, of shame, of unresolved remorse. Lack of meaning or purpose. 
We can become anxious or depressed if we have a lack of meaning or purpose in our life. Now, some of this is actually helpful, okay? We have to stop looking at it as something that's wrong and looking at it as something like, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Oh, maybe there's something that I need to look at in my life, in my relationship, my career. You know what, really, I don't like my boss. What am I going to do about it? Okay, well, I'm going to look at what's possible, what my options are. All of a sudden, I'm not so anxious. Gee, there's something I need to communicate to my partner, and I just keep swallowing it and swallowing it and swallowing it. Well, guess what? You're going to get depressed or indigestion, or maybe both. So, um, ancestral baggage. Did anybody know what I mean by this? I worked with a lot of people who were adults of uh, Holocaust survivors. This is very difficult, challenging ancestral baggage. Uh, indigenous people, uh, the baggage of uh, cultural and genocide. And so people can have ancestral baggage, the things that have traveled down through from grandparents and great-grandparents. And how do, we, how do we create a framework for working with this? How do we return this? As a, we used to, as a tribe, as a clan, as a group, we used to hold each other up in circumstances like this. We used to support each other. It wasn't just barn raising. It was somebody's going through a tragedy and we gather in and we help you go through it. So how do we create that back into our society? And one of my personal favorites, the road not taken and the call not answered. We're going to get into Joseph Campbell in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, is somebody keeping track of coming? Okay, somebody is good. Current cultural environment is materialistic. Everybody agrees? Okay, uh, I, I'm materialistic. Anyone want to join me? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. We are all materialistic. We live in a materialistic society. We like comfort. We like hot showers or warm clothing, right? We like it. Our good food. Consumerism. How do we find a balance of nature and self and being in relationship and charity and society? How do we find a balance there? Pseudo intimacy. That's a whole day's lecture unto itself, everybody's in their phone. I actually had somebody tell me a few months ago, oh, you know, look, I've got uh, two and a half thousand friends. <laughs> <laughs> actually, buddy, you don't have any friends. Those aren't friends. Just as they showed you a picture of their lunch, they're not your friend. When, when, what happened to society? A friend used to be someone that you knew, that you took time to get to know, and to care about. A friend was someone that you respected and trusted. That's what a friend was. Okay. And this is epidemic in our society. A lack of awareness of personal responsibility for self-care and well-being. Mm -hmm. Yes, would you agree? Yes. A complete lack of awareness. No, and is it something that's missing in the home? Is it missing in school? Is it missing in society? Where did we go wrong and how can we correct this? I mean, I'm teaching my little small grandchildren. Honey, you're not doing that for the teacher. You're doing it for yourself. Okay? So that the right idea, oh, I'm doing this for my well-being. So you take your vitamins and you brush your teeth because you need your teeth to last a long time, don't you? So we teach from a young age personal responsibility. Where does mom and dad do everything in this helicopter society? So the children are growing up very entitled and not knowing how to take care of themselves. And all of this leads to a whole lot of things. So the consequence of modern culture is little or no spirituality. A lack of awareness of the authentic self. Everybody know what I mean by the authentic self? Oh, good. Lack of awareness of connection, and I mean the true connection to nature. In other words, me and the tree, we're one. That kind of connection, not just that there's a tree out there. But that tree to be healthy means forest. It means sunlight. It means a lack of, and this is really key, a lack of elders, wisdom keepers, and mentors. Where is it? Where is it? Our, our, we've been, we kind of have been Americanized through um, the deities of Hollywood and rock music and 
and modern music, and they have taken the position um, that rightly belongs to, to them is attributed what should be being attributed to elders and wisdom keepers. Does that make sense? We have, in our society, we have taken senior people and instead of giving them the opportunity to share their wisdom and experience in life, we have taught them that they need to look younger, act younger, right? And they need to join the young kind of way of looking at things, or we'll stick them in a home. Spiritual emergence looks like this. Spiritual emergence is this wonderful, gradual awakening. It occurs at a rate in which one is able to integrate and one is able to work with and understand uh, one's sense of self in an enlarging perspective of reality, beliefs, and everyday responsibilities. Changes occur and decisions are made that contribute to well-being and health. And this is really important. This is a healthy spiritual emergence. So somebody might start reading some books about spirituality or start going to um, take a yoga class or tai chi or meditate or uh, take some studies or training of some kind that is going to support or perhaps they follow in the, in the footsteps of their ancestors and they return to the church, synagogue, temple. Um, of their of their family upbringing and find meaning in the ritual and and peace and harmony in the teachings. So, but this is a gradual awakening. Uh, it can be integrated. Um, spiritual emergency looks more like this. We're not in the meadow with flowers. Okay, it's the alone in the desert. It's the walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's a, a little swim in the sea of lost souls. It's the storm, the chaotic, lightning-filled storm. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Spiritual emergency, yeah. Quite a lot of us have been through that. And, and it can be a short period of time that gets managed really well with good maps and understanding. Or it can be something that, if not well uh, diagnosed or attended to, can actually lead into, a, into years of a lost life of difficulty, anxiety, depression, or other more serious affect. So transformational crisis, when personal growth becomes overwhelming or chaotic, when too many chakras blow open and all the repressed, unintegrated material from the lower unconscious comes ripping up in, in an undefined way, not able to work with it. When there is a lack of maps to process, to support the evolution of the experience, when there isn't a way of helping somebody work with what's going on for them, to be able to say to them, there's this happening, and this is what's going to happen. It's, going to, it's like, can you imagine a woman pregnant, goes into labor, she has no idea what labor is, there's no midwife. Now those of us who've given birth in this room, I was really happy to have midwife and supporters and, and prenatal classes, okay, you're going to have this and you're going to have that, so there's a map to hold on to, and when you feel this, it means this is happening. Yeah, it still hurt, it was scary, but at least you have this map of, okay, there's something, there's a process here that I can work with, and even if it's difficult, it's going to bring me to a place. Um, in transformational work, we say, well, there's no resurrection without a death. And it's an ego death. It's the ego death that most of us are most worried about. <coughs> the sense of who I am and who I think I need to be that often has to go through a death. Dark nights and difficult passages. This is a again, a whole one-day program um, of what that looks like. And all of us go through at some point. It is not possible. Uh, the Buddha said, the four great truths, life is difficult. Uh, I'm putting it into modern language. Life is difficult. No one escapes illness or suffering. We all age and we all die. These are four great truths. And it's when we resist that. We all want life to be easy. Come on, let's admit it. 
We love it when we get a parking spot right in front of the place we're going to. <laughs> right? Come on. Instead of circling 20 minutes and then parking 20 blocks away. We don't like life being difficult. It's inconvenient. We want life to be easy, and it's not. So a lot of our angst, our daily angst, comes from not just accepting that this is the way life is. None of us escapes illness or suffering. Stay with Buddha for another minute. Now this is the reality, but how do we go through all this and suffering? What kind of tools do we work with? What kind of maps are we working with? What does our, what does our church, our, our center, our circle offer us? So up to the hero's journey. Uh, sorry if I'm flipping through this quickly, but uh, I want to get there. Everybody knows Joseph Campbell, probably the greatest mythologist of the last century. The work he did, um, of course, Young that spoke meaningfully about archetypes and wrote beautifully about archetypes. But it is not, was not a new concept. Archetypes are not a new concept. Ask any shaman. You know, say, yeah. Ask any umban, the person who knows the Orishas. They know about this. They have other names for them. But these forces are real to them. These aren't intellectual constructs. These are real forces that have powerful influences on our individual lives. So Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey. I would say we're all in a hero's journey. Each one of us in this room is living on a hero's journey. There's the departure, the initiation, and the return. At any stage, the soul's journey can become blocked, usually because of fear. We fear the next step. We fear what we have to let go of. Because usually the hero's journey, we have to leave something behind. Yes? Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Classic. You know, he had to leave the planet behind, his family behind, his former life behind. There's a, you know, Dorothy and Wizard of Oz, she had to leave Kansas behind. So there's a departure. There's the call. We answer the call. We answer the call. I got the call. I the call. You go home, you start a church. Man, it doesn't look like that's going to be very easy. So you get the call, you follow it. Okay? So there's a departure. You go on your journey. There's the initiations that naturally come. There's always a dragon in the forest, there's a troll under the bridge, there's a wicked witch, there's all these difficult, dark things that must be faced. Why? Does somebody say he does? <laughs> Why? Why? Because how else do we develop the very things that we need to do the journey? How do we develop clarity, wisdom, courage, faith, determination, hope, camaraderie? There's always traveling companions. There's always the access to the higher self or a magic wand or a special something or a yoga or whatever. There's always a that. Okay? But these stories are wonderful in helping us to understand our own story. So that even when we're walking alone, we're never alone. I've got lots of stories on that one. So what happens if we become blocked and refuse the call? We will become anxious and depressed. If we flee the challenge, oh, there's the dragon. I'm just going to tiptoe back out of the forest and pretend I didn't go in. But the way that the journey has to go through that forest, well, I'll try and find a way around. <coughs> And then I'll veg out and begin to watch TV and go and read, I don't know, choose your poison, um, and pretend that the forest and the dragon isn't there. Well, that's not going to work. Okay? So avoiding the initiations doesn't work. Refusing to return. This is an interesting one. I'm up on the mountain. Everything's great. I get it now. I'm not going back. <laughs> you have to. Consequences, depression, anxiety, and stress. So let's say factors for improving well-being. How do we go forward with this? Have what role the non-ordinary states of consciousness, whether they are spontaneous, whether they are sought out through meditation, uh, through practices with uh, entheogens or psychedelics. All of these factors are part of it. Whatever we are doing as we are going forward. So if we want to be well, these are the pieces. Nutrition, exercise social connections, positive attitude, music, singing chances, preferably in a group. Your, your brain activity, your brain waves are changed. 
the, the research on Google, about what Google knows everything, and Google it, what happens to your brain on music. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing, and it's wonderful. And people say, oh, I can't sing. Well, of course you can sing. And say maybe you can sing well, but you can <laughs> sing. And the more you sing, actually, the better you sing. It's remarkable when people say, oh, I can't sing, end up singing, and really quite well most of the time. Meditation, spiritual, or religious practices. How are we doing for time? We're getting there. We're getting there. A couple of last thoughts on this before we do a little bit of a round table thing where you get to ask questions, and where I'm hoping what we're going to be talking about is what does the future look like for the people who want to integrate um, the use of non-ordinary states, especially mediated through psychedelics or infusions, what does that look like? What is the future and how do we get there? And so my kind of final notes on this section is the following. If you do not practice awareness and self-responsibility in your own well-being, do not expect anybody else to do it for you. Okay? You must be willing to do all of these things to correct your diet. And if that means stopping certain things, guess what? Grow up and stop it. Oh, I can't give up my cigarettes. Okay, well, you know what? There's some great programs that can help you. Go sign up. There's some patches or some gum or something. It's going to help you. Let's encourage you. Hey, go on, come on, do it. Can't stop drinking? Okay, 12-step programs. There's something for everyone who's stuck in the I can't. There, there really is. No one has the excuse anymore of saying, I can't and there's nothing to help me. There is something for everyone to help, no matter where someone is stuck and that I can't. You know what I mean by the I can't thing, eh? Okay. Uh, no pictures of the slides, please. Uh, so, nutrition, exercise. Exercise has shown to be the uh, most effective means of reducing depression. Daily exercise. If you take meditation, exercise, and good nutrition, you probably eliminated most anxiety and depression. If you work with your blocked grief and your fears about going forward and your low self esteem, you're going forward. If you still feel called to use entheogens or psychedelics, then that's a calling. And that's something inside of you that no one outside of you can tell you about. That's my personal belief on this. It is a calling. You must feel called to this. But please don't expect it to replace these things because it won't. It will not replace them. You can't eat junk, and binge watch TV, and don't do exercise, and have no social connections, and take uh, some kind of psychedelic uh, once or twice, and think that you don't not that you're not going to be told to do all of this. You know, uh, through the years I've had, from time to time, people will come into our church and they will take, they will drink dandy with us, and, and then a couple of times, I think about maybe three times in the 20-something years, they'll come to me afterwards and they'll say, you know, uh, I met a being, and the being said to me, I'm not allowed to come back here. And I said, okay, because I know already what the being said. And I said, do you want to share what you were told? They said, yeah, the being said to me, you're not doing what you've already been shown to do. Do not come back here until you've done that. Another person said, shared with me, um, after a couple of times they drank any with us, they said, you know, I met a being, and I thought, okay, yeah, I made the same being, right? And they said, you know, the being said to me, why aren't you doing what you've been shown to do? Why are you coming here again? You've been shown what you must do. So we can't fool those realms. We can't fake. We can't. We have to be willing to be stripped of all our illusions and, and really stripped down, no illusions, and see reality of ourselves, the reality of reality. And say we're over the block. <laughs> okay. Okay, wow. The conversation. 